All right, I think a lot of people are here, so we'll start. Hassan and everyone, thank you for joining us back on our webinar. Yesterday, we had a great session with Dr. Samia about what grief really is, its own struggles, and what the grieving person really goes through. We talked about the new way to grieve, people grieve in this pandemic and the struggles they faced, and then we touched upon the do's and don'ts of considering another grieving person. Today, we changed our layout a touch by shortening the break to five minutes so we can have a longer q and session. Because the q and session is cut short, and in fact, could share the questions with you, so we'll have those today. And in our short break, we'll be joined by one of our participants, Smak, for the uh, Thank you for that. Uh, that being said, if anybody feels like they need for an energizer, we have one prepared so you can inform us during the session. So today, it's with my greatest honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Yusuf Reza, who's no stranger to any inquiry, a psychiatrist, motivational speaker, and founder and CEO of Telepsychiatry Pakistan. We'll be talking to us about our next two topics. So you have the floor. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. I got a little confused in the middle. You said something about trans uh, recitation that's going to take place. That's going to happen before or in the break? It's going to be during the five minutes break. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'll meet from here on in. All right. So um, thank you all for joining us here. Thank you. particularly to the organizers for um, making this possible, for bringing all of us together, for um, asking Dr. Samia and myself to speak with all of you. And to be quite honest, it's um, of all the online events that I have participated in, and they've been a lot over the past year, all I've actually done is give talks online. Um, and I frankly, really miss live a live audience um, or an in-person or in, in the same room audience. I haven't had that in over a year, I guess. Uh, but nevertheless, in all the ones that I have had online, this was one of the better organized ones, more um, well-planned, well-coordinated. Um, the way you guys went about it is really, really heartwarming as to how there are people who would care for their for topics such as these and then go beyond the job description go beyond the call of duty to put things together so um aruba laiba and ably led by aina thank you all three of you and of course i'm sure you had a team but these are the three people that i interacted with um you guys have done a wonderful job putting this together. So, no problem at all. Okay. So, um, I'm sure you had a wonderful interaction with Dr. Samia. Um, I was actually looking forward to this talk more than most talks that I'm, I've given because most talks are topics that I have told them that this is what I'm going to talk about. This you told me. So I had to um, really think about this and I caught myself planning this talk and thinking about what I'm going to say uh, more than I usually do for different reasons. Um, but that took me away from a lot of other activities that I should have been focusing on at that time. So not a good thing. Nevertheless, it is what it is. I am here. I should have probably been here yesterday as according to the original plan, but I wasn't able to, uh, which as it has it so happened, a very close friend lost his father and um, I had to be there for him at the janaza and everything. Um, and that ties in with the topic that we had for yesterday and that we're gonna have for today as well. Um, and there's there's, because these concepts were running through my head 
and I was going to talk to you about them. There's a lot that I saw yesterday um, that added up with respect to this uh, conception of grieving and how to recover from that experience. Um, as I understand it, the discussion that you did have with Dr. Samia yesterday, um, you did the Kubler-Ross stages, and then um, you built upon those stages to discuss um, the, the warden stages, I believed, as to um, take it to the next level or, you know, develop that understanding of grief, um, accept it, take it to the level of acceptance. So I think that's where I'm going to take off from. When we're finding, when we're talking about finding new meaning in life, after a loved one is gone, it is important to place those, those in context, okay? But even before I do that, there is one thing that I'm gonna uh, stress upon. When we talk about grief, as psychiatrists, as psychologists, basically as scientists, we miss out on a huge aspect of grief. Because what grief is experientially, what grief is with respect to what an individual person goes through, the way it has found expression artistically in paintings, in sculptures, in architecture, in poetry, in music, in stories, in literature, in media. It takes the, the, the depiction is at another level altogether. And it goes to show what the intuitive expression of emotions that are felt or experienced deeply, it's, it's so much more. It is so much more than um, we can elaborate breaking things down. I mean, you did the, the, the stages, um, both the stages, but you ask the person who's actually experiencing it, who's actually going through that. The experience of, of grief is so much more than that. And the experience of grief is, in a lot of ways, an experience of love. You grieve that which you loved. And to understand grief, you cannot begin to do so if you don't understand love. And to recover from grief, to recover from that experience of, um, of loss of a loved one, that recovery is not possible, not really possible, unless we comprehend both um, intellectually and definitely emotionally. We have to come to terms with the, a deeper understanding of love. People who are capable of kindness, people who are capable of giving, com sharing compassion, people who are capable of being good to others, and I think this ties in with the second part of our um, of our topic. As doctors, 
I'm just going to touch on this now and come back to it later. There's different kinds of doctors that you will see. एक वो डॉक्टर है जो अपने मरीजों के साथ एक कंपैशन के साथ एक दर्द के साथ एक केयर के साथ डील करते हैं they they actually interact with their patient like they're interacting with a human being influenced impacted by how they're dealt with by how they're spoken to by how their pain is acknowledged by their doctor right ek wo category and unfortunately unfortunately wo category ek minority mein hai uh you're all medical students here you've been through your wards you've seen your seniors your um consultants interact with their patients and i don't have to ask you to know what you've seen is typically not a human to human interaction it's not a human to human interaction for the most part unfortunately the human to human interaction is an exception and i'll tell you straight out when you have seen that human to human interaction when you have seen a compassion a kindness a love that a doctor is able to express unconditionally to their patients if you do see that exception agar aapko kahin wo nazar aa jaye dhoond unhe chirage rukhe zeba leke agar mil jaye aapko then know that the person who is expressing it is a person who has experienced grief very deeply but has come to terms with it has worked through it has matured as a consequence of it and that's why they're able to be the empathic doctors that you see for them to be going beyond the call of duty tika saron ko lagana aata आईवी लाइन सारों को डालनी आती है अपेंडिक्स कोई भी निकाल लेता है कोई आपने तीर नहीं मारा अगर आप वो सारे स्टैंडर्ड प्रोसीजर्स कर सकते हो सीरियसली देयर इज नो जी आई एम सॉरी समबडी वन इज दैट ओके व्हाट इज what is going to distinguish you as a physician as a surgeon especially as a psychiatrist is how human you are in your interactions and quite honestly the humanness is lost in the standard typical way we're taught and trained it's lost the distinction i'm creating right now is the people who are able to be empathic and human in their interactions are those people who have experienced grief prerequisite number 1 prerequisite number 2 they have worked through it maturely they have grown as a consequence of that experience agar hum log apne patients ke sath interaction ke andar wo compassion wo humanness नहीं शो कर पा रहे तो आई दर वीव नेफर एक्सपीरियंस ग्रीफ रियली और अगर ग्रीफ एक्सपीरियंस किया है तो उसकी प्रोसेसिंग उसकी कमिंग टू टर्म्स विद इट अंडरस्टैंडिंग इट दैट हैज हैपन दैट हैज इट्स बिन डन रॉन्गली इट हैज बिन डन बैडली एंड द द वे द द होल एक्सपीरियंस वाज डेल्ट विद is how they lead in their doctor patient interactions 
if that wasn't done right, if there was some pathology, and that pathology is in terms of choices that we make during that interaction. And that's what results in an inhumane, an unkind, an unjust interaction. Okay, so that being said, coming back, when we say that grief is the loss of a loved one, we understand that what love is, that that particular person, it may even be an abstraction, it may be a concept, it may be a cause, it may be a, a commitment to a social good. That's all, those are all things that, um, ideas that can be loved, but let's be very specific. Filhal hum uh, loving person ki baat kar rahe. Loving a person. When you love a person, you love something about them or some things about them, aspects of them. Okay, that's a psychological level of love. Or wo love kya demand karta hai? Wo love demand karta hai. Wo ye dekhta hai ki ye banda ya ye bandi mere liye kya kar sakta hai? What can they give me through their beauty, through their strength, through their efforts, through their social status, through their finances, whatever the case may be, through their humor, through their personality characteristics, whatever. The psychological level of love, or for that matter, the physical level of love as well, Let's make it at two levels now. Physical or psychological level, pe pyar kya dekhta hai ki ye mere liye kya kar sakta hai? And there's essentially nothing wrong with that. Uske saath stuff gets, starts getting wrong if that's all there is to a person's love. If that's all there is to a person's love, there's even a spiritual level to that, um, to that selfish love. How he makes me feel. And ideal is satisfaction or contentment. Physical satisfaction, contentment. Psychological satisfaction, contentment. Physical, that's lust, that's pleasure that you get from those interactions. Psychologically, a level of sense of security. Protectedness feeling. Or spiritually, wo ek tranquility, or ek, you know, it's that um, nirvana type of a feeling that that person or that interaction can give you. Um, obviously, this is I have an entire series on this, uh, a workshop on what love is. I'm just giving you the gist of that because without understanding love, we can't really make any headway into understanding grief. But these are all, this is. At all these three levels, this love is selfish love. Mujhe kya mil raha hai? Mujhe pleasure mil raha hai, mujhe security mil rahi hai, mujhe satisfaction mil rahi hai. Thik ho gaya. Agar to kisi ka love sirf yahi tak raha, idhar tak mehdood raha, isse aage nahi badha, then Getting through grief is like going through hell. Because necessarily that person that could give you all of that at those three levels is gone. They can't do that anymore. Or even if they, they may not have to pass away. They may just change as a person. Personality changes as a result of certain life events or just as life goes on certain difficulties that they experience they're not the same person anymore or they're incapacitated in one way or the other it's still going to be that loss and that loss is going to be very difficult to deal with if our interaction with that person or is that our relationship with that person was entirely and absolutely just on what we could get from them, that it was entirely 
selfish. Or in another way, it was fish love. So just to illustrate that a little bit, um, there's a story that I, I heard this on Facebook from a rabbi. Um, and the way that story goes, the way that story goes is that a person asks the other person, um, what do you like to eat? He's like, I love fish. I think I'm kind of screwing up the story, but I'll give you the gist. He's like, you love fish? He's like, yes, I love fish. He's like, what do you mean you love fish? He's like, I really love fish. He's like, oh, so you love it that you take the fish out of the water, you um, deprive it of its habitat, it dies for the lack of water, and then you chop it up, you spice it up, you heat it up, burn it even, and then you eat it. Is that what you mean by loving fish? Like, uh, yeah. So we have to be very careful if our interaction with people, uh, if our interaction with people, if our love for people is fish love, then when they are no longer capable of giving us that whatever we get from them, it's going to be a loss that is going to be very difficult to process and get through and get over. But we have to understand that there's beyond this physical, beyond this selfish, there is a more meaningful aspect to love, a truly holistic aspect of love in which all of those psychological, physical, spiritual come together and it is a bi-directional interaction. It's a two-way interaction. Just not only receiving, just not selfishness, self-transcendence is also, but predominant. Hai. And that's a holistic, um, and that looks to appreciate the person as a whole. It doesn't look only the physical dimensions. Ko nahi dekhta. वो फिर उसकी सिर्फ साइकोलॉजिकल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स को नहीं देखता वो फिर उसकी वो स्पिरिचुअली व्हाट इट हैज टू द पर्सन हैज टू गिव यू उसको नहीं देखता वो उसको पूरा देखता एंड एज फार एज द होल पर्सन इज कंसर्न 1 plus 1 plus 1 is not equal to 3 it is equal to something incredibly unique irreplaceable not uh, something that cannot be broken down Okay, so that's what we're looking at. That is what we're looking at when we're looking at love. And now when we look at love in this way in which we have to keep both things in front of receiving too. It's very difficult to keep receiving too. Right? We have to look at our own capacity as well. We cannot be entirely selfless and self-transcendent. We have needs as human beings and they have to be balanced. In a lot of ways, if you try to be self-transcendent, if you try to be very giving and no receiving, it's not sustainable. It is not sustainable. You won't be able to keep it up. You can't serve from an empty cup. Right? Now, when a loss takes place, a loss of that loved one, as far as the physical aspect of what they could give you is concerned, that's gone. Psychological aspect of what they could give you in terms of that sense of security, that's gone. Spiritually, what they could give you in terms of that contentment and satisfaction, that is also gone. But what is left is what you could give them. And that is your that is what you bring to the to the mix to that relationship that's your self transcendent meaningful contribution to that person or jabwo when you lose them the experience of grief 
is losing their presence and losing all of what they could give you and that deserves that you bereave them, that you cry for them. The worst things that could possibly be done, and I'm sure you had that discussion yesterday, is to give an anti-anxiety to a grieving person. Unko sedative de, then so jao. Numb yourself through the pain. No, that's an insult to the love that that person had for what they meant to them. Right? So that pain is, is important. For what that pain signifies is how important that person was. Or, to be honest, let's be very clear on this from the get-go. When we enter into any loving relationship, we tacitly agree on grieving their loss, on the pain that their loss will bring to us. We are giving that agreement. It's part of the contract of love, that, that unwritten contract. I am loving you, it means that I am going to go to your side, to बर्दाश्त करने के लिए तैयार हूँ। You're worth it. The memories that you will give me are worth it. The growth that I will experience as a consequence of our interaction is worth it. And the growth that I can experience when you're gone is worth it. And the growth that I will contribute to you while you're with me and when you're not with me is worth it. That's a that's a fine print in every relationship contract that we usually don't read or see or realize until the loss actually takes place. And to be honest, that loss takes place not just with death of having that person leave for good, but whenever that person has to leave temporarily. A parent for a child, child has to go to school and then college and then university and gets married, has a job, has to go somewhere else. Or some other calling, passion, meaning takes them away. You have to put up with it. You have to put up with it. That's in your contract. That's the contract of love. So every relationship is a dialectic. It's a, it's a tug of war even between the selfish and selfless aspects of love. When, grief, when loss happens, what is manifest by grieving is what I could get from that relationship by the presence of that person, the physical presence of that person. I can't get that anymore. And so there is a preponderance of emotions, of sadness. But somewhere along the way, was your self transcendent side thi na relationship ki? Was your selfless side thi relationship ki? Wo bhi hoti hai. Or wo responsibility dalti hai aap pe. Wo responsibility, or what, what is that responsibility for? Meaningful action. Doing something for that other person. That 
manifests itself throughout the the grieving process jab funeral hoga jab log aayenge afsos karne jo janaza hoga janaze ke sath jana hai uske sare jo everything that's going on at that time it's asking of you to take responsibility mehmano jo afsos karne aa rahe hain unki responsibility ghusl karane ki responsibility janaze ki responsibility ek jagah se dusri jagah mayit ko leke jaane ki responsibility namaz ki responsibility usme dua ki responsibility qabar khodne ki responsibility unko usme dalne ki responsibility aur usse bhi badhkar that person who is passing away wasn't just flesh and blood that person who passed away also had responsibilities that person who passed away stood for something in this world in this life they had values they had meaning wo maashre ko kuch dete the wo maashre ke liye koi sahara the maashre mein kuch log the jo un pe dependent the maashre mein kuch log the koi cause thi koi fikr thi koi khayal tha koi teaching thi कोई लेगेसी थी जिसको किसी लेवल पे वो इंडोर्स करते थे सपोर्ट करते थे अपहोल्ड करते थे उसको लेके चलते थे वन आई एम शोल्डरिंग दैट कॉफिन दैट द वेट ऑफ the deceased is not all of what i am carrying on my shoulder it is not just the weight of their body it is the weight of what they stood for it is the weight of what they upheld in their lives as their meaning as their as their legacy is what i am volunteering myself to shoulder and those of you who have seen a funeral procession hamare yahan jab janaza hota hai to sirf char log nahi coffin ko uthate the entire procession is taking turns kabhi koi aata hai kabhi koi aata hai kabhi koi aata hai kabhi koi aata hai typically yahi hota hai ke the 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 male first degree relatives wo zyada they they don't want to leave they want to carry it all the way to the end a lot of them some of them would be very distant you know there's different ways that people process it or 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 react or respond but nevertheless what is the community saying aapki sari zimmedariyan hamari zimmedari uske baad elan bhi hota hai कि अगर मरहूम का कोई कर्ज है किसी पे तो ये उनके बेटे मौजूद हैं वो ये कर्ज अदा करेंगे आई वॉन्ट एस टू रिकगनाइज दैट कर्ज एज द पीपल दैट द डिसीज हैज लेफ्ट बिहाइंड दैट कर्ज इज नॉट जस्ट मॉनिटरी इट्स नॉट जस्ट फाइनेंशियल इट्स नॉट जस्ट इकोनॉमिक it is the meaning that they leave behind so jab hum us grieving process se recover kar rahe hain ab wo emotions wala jo uh, burden hai ya jo emotions wala the, 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 the emotion part of that relationship which was overwhelming which is manifest by that by the weeping by the crying by the pain the emotion aspect was huge 
the responsibility aspect was minimal. It pertained to mostly just the funeral related activities, hosting the people, process the prayer and all of that. As time goes on, the percentage of the emotion decreases and is replaced with the responsibility, with the sense of responsibility of carrying that burden, of that legacy, of that meaning, of that relates that relates to that person. I hope that's making sense. As time goes on, the crying would be less. The pain of the grief would be less. And it precisely in that proportion, the sense of responsibility is going to increase. So what we step back into, what we step back into is not going to be the same routine. It is going to be some routine but hopefully a more meaningful routine. And it's going to be a gradual return. We have to give those emotions their time. And we have to gradually increase the responsibility domain as well. Gradually. If from day one, the emotions are denied and responsibility is all that a person is willing to carry, then they'll be crushed under that weight. They'll be crushed under that weight. So what we want to do, what we want to do is give that, those emotions the time that they need because they're, in a sense, what those emotions are doing, they're providing you with the fuel that you need eventually to carry that responsibility. The emotions are producing within your personality that capacity to carry what is to come later on. The pain is cultivating inside you the ability to carry that responsibility. Because mind you, any meaningful activity is painful. Being a force of good in society, bringing positive change in society, Something as um, apparently straightforward as arranging an online seminar requires you to take a lot of pains. Okay, so when we talk about being responsible citizens, responsible Muslims, responsible individuals, human beings, our capacity to carry responsibility is directly influenced, enhanced, built, developed by how much pain we've experienced and processed appropriately. And processed appropriately. So you find within that world that you go back to meaning in life, that meaning is enhanced by understanding that grieving process, by understanding that grieving process. That meaning is going to be apparent to you in different ways 
that meaning is going to be recognized by you recognizing your own mortality that when you see when you suffer loss you experience vulnerability jab koi aur jata hai aapko apne jaane ka ya is cheez ka ehsaas ke aapne bhi chale jana hai wo zyada zor se hota hai it hits you and when it does hit you you get a sense of i got work to do too it may or may not be related to the meaning or legacy of the deceased it may be your own meaning and even with the meaning and legacy of the deceased your meaning is going to be unique when it finds fulfillment at your hands so the passion with which you then look for meaning in your life is all the more important is all the more important let me give you an example uh, and then i'm going to close for break i think it's been 30 minutes i've been speaking the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam muhammadur rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the love that he had for khadija radhiyallahu ta'ala anha when hazrat khadija radhiyallahu ta'ala anha passes away the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reported not to have smiled for months this you see the emotional burden of that loss manifesting itself he did not smile for months that year is known as amul huzn the year of grief Surah Yusuf was revealed around that time to console Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you see the emotional part of the burden of loss of grief manifesting itself. Now look at the the meaningful part or the responsibility part. As the Aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she says that she did not feel jealous of any of the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. as she did of khadija even though she never met her but the love that rasulullah expressed after she had passed away was so intense that as the aisha felt jealous to the effect that whenever there would be a sacrifice the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would insist that a portion of that is sent to hazrat khadija's friends radhiyallahu ta'ala anha he remembered her his responsibility towards her through her friends that when she was in a way when hazrat aisha became angry and frustrated and said a couple of passed a couple of insensitive remarks about hazrat khadija radhiyallahu ta'ala anha the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam became enraged became angry he said no not about her you don't say anything about her and he clearly enunciated all of what hazrat khadija meant to him she supported me when everyone left me she gave me one when everyone denied me she stood by me when i was by myself i had children only from her he would clearly say that it was only in her presence that jibril would come and jibril would say that allah sends his salam to khadija he would say that i was razaqtu bi hubbiha if i'm not forgetting the words ruziqtu ruziqtu bi hubbiha i have been nurtured by her love her love nurtured me 
These are the words of Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after she has passed away. So the responsibility dimension, you see that manifesting as well as the emotional dimension. That's true love. That's a mature way of grieving. And we find that manifesting itself more in people's lives. Like I said, in more aesthetic expressions, then we can possibly articulate in concrete scientific terms as such. So I think I've um, probably overstretched the first session. It's probably a good time for a break. Yes, sir, Jazakullah for that talk and that great example of the Prophet Right now, we'll be joined by Smok from 43rd MBBS, and he'll be reciting a surah for us, Talawat. Uh, Smok, you have the floor. Assalamualaikum. Am I audible? Yes, yes you are. are audible. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح اسم ربك العلا الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غفاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصل النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح ما تذكر وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي 
صحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى صدق الله العظيم Subhanallah, mashallah, smak, and jazakallah for that beautiful Rajat presentation. Uh, we'll continue with the second session now. Okay. Bismillah uh, salatu wa rasulillah. Um, the second part of what I wanted to talk to you about, although I did hint at it in the first, um, coming back to normalcy. See, most of what I spoke about in the first session is the understanding part of it. The theoretical part, if you will. But the more we're able to internalize that, the more we're able to come to terms with these ideas, with these concepts, where love isn't this, um, this fairy tale, happily ever after where, you know, you're just, the honeymoon never ends. It's not what love is. Where these um, childish, romantic, perceptions are, we're able to grow out of them, is when we're able to deal with these situations in a more mature way. And sometimes, to be honest, you can have an intellectual recognition of these ideas, but it's only when that experience hits, when the realization is more pressing, and it's something we, if we choose not to follow, there will be dire consequences. There will be, um, we will become those toxic people. We will become those toxic people. Okay. So there was an aspect of, um, of our conversation that related with Dealing with the lingering feeling of loss or sadness. See, the lingering feeling is something to be cherished. Is something that you want to, the lingering trauma. The sadness that you feel at the memory of the loved one. They deserve it. And you want to give yourself that chance to express it in silence, in tears, in words, in prayers, or in action. Some of the most beautiful pieces of art creativity, social service have emanated from the, that pain and the persistence of that pain and the lingering of that pain. Hospitals, orphanages, symphonies, pieces of art, so much that we've seen, that we see, that we enjoy, that we cherish, comes from that. So I would say 
like I said, the immediately after the the loss, the proportion of emotions is it predominates and the responsibility part is minimal extending to a few activities as time goes on it's not that the responsibility part takes over completely and there is nothing of emotions left we don't want that either something of that should linger something of that should linger okay we would want that one now of course if it is too intense if it is interfering with our productivity our routine our uh, the distress is more overwhelming for longer than is usual and i'm sure you spoke about that with Dr. Samia yesterday, then professional help may be sought. Other than that, I, I don't think it's there is any reason to pathologize the lingering pain. It is a normal human experience. It is a normal human experience. It should be dealt with as such, meaningfully translated as best as possible. As for preparing medical students to deal with witnessing loss as medical professionals in the future, first up, there's going to be a lot of it. Some of it may be at your hands as well. If you're going to be a surgeon, if you're going to be a physician, even if you're going to be a psychiatrist, in the process of doing good, you will realize that there is only so much good you can do. There was this movie that there was this line, we're always fighting to save people's lives. Do we ever stop to think who is it that we're fighting against or what is it that we're fighting against? A lot of times it's much stronger, much more inevitable than what we have to offer. And so we will have to accept our inadequacies. Despite our progression, despite our development, despite our intelligence, despite our experience, despite everything, we will have to accept as much as we can do. There is so much that we can't. At another level, the damage may be hydrogenic. It may be us. may have mistakes that we made. Okay, can everyone hear me now? I think I got lost for a little bit. Okay, so when we 
we're going to make mistakes. And if you're not ready for that, you're in the wrong profession. You don't want to make mistakes. You want to try your best not to make mistakes. But you're going to have to deal with that as well. The, diff the difference between a specialist and a non-specialist is that a specialist is less likely to make mistakes. Not that they're never going to make mistakes. We're going to have to live with them. So in our in our noblest intentions of doing good, we may end up doing some bad. So you need to be prepared to deal with loss, witnessing loss, and even being somewhat responsible for it. Both levels. And let me tell you another thing. The default practice, the default system as it has developed, of education, of training, is such that you will be desensitized to that loss. So more than preparing you for dealing with that loss or dealing with witnessing that loss, and preparing you for the pain that you will feel when you witness that loss, what I feel is more important is to warn you so that you can do something to ensure you don't become desensitized to that pain that you don't become desensitized to that loss. Because that's a bigger problem. If you're sad, hurt, grieving, the loss of a patient then your humanity is still alive. I want you to be concerned about maintaining that. You may experience it the first time. You, you see that in your house job, maybe the first few times. But the more senior you get, the more desensitized you get. And that's unfortunate. That's the, that's the tragedy. That law, that death of humanity inside of a physician or a surgeon is much more tragic, is a bigger loss than losing a patient. I don't see anyone grieving that tragedy. I don't see anyone grieving that loss of humanity. I don't see anyone grieving that desensitization. That's a problem. That's a bigger problem. So I want for you to be cognizant of that so you can somehow preclude that prevent that, guard yourself against that. See, one of the few things that I regret in becoming a psychiatrist, and I became a psychiatrist when you did house job, you could choose whatever speciality to do your house job in with the, the three months, three months, three months, three months, three months that they have now, surgery, medicine, and then um, surgery and allied and medicine and allied. 
we didn't have that. I was actually the last batch that didn't have that. So I just went for six months in psychiatry and six months in ophthalmology. So one of the regrets that I do have is I didn't get to practice that real medicine, that real surgery, on call every other day, ER, appendicectomies, CPRs, you know, the whole stuff going on. Didn't really get to do that. Open confession, and that's a regret. But at one level, I don't regret that. But for sure, what you gain in terms of skill and experience from that entire inhumane process, really, of um, constant duties, you gain a lot of skill, resilience, all of that. But there is something you lose as well. And unfortunately, in a lot of my colleagues, I saw that loss as a loss of humanity. When I was rotating in medicine, as a psychiatry resident, we were supposed to rotate in the medical ward. And in that medical ward, I think the one of the first patients that I saw was one with um, chronic liver disease. It was a Babaji. As his symptoms included depression, I was required to assess him. I assessed him. I spoke to him. I spent a long time talking to him. I got to know him, his life, his sadness, his pain. I did what I could to help him in whatever way. When I came one day to the same ward, his bed was empty. The sheets were clean. The side table was vacated, nothing there. His name was missing from the the board on top of his bed. When the round happened, nobody spoke about him. When everyone was there, there wasn't a single word mentioned about him, about that Babaji. It was as if nobody cared. Just a couple of days ago, at least three different groups of people in a matter of a few hours had surrounded his bed, identifying different manifestations of liver disease in his entire body, talking about the different treatment regimens the physiology, the pathology, the anatomy, the, the pharmacology. Forget about a, a prayer, forget about a moment of silence, not a single word. He's just gone. फलाने बेड वाले पेशेंट को क्या हुआ वो फलाने बेड वाला पेशेंट एक्सपायर हो गया कुछ दवाई है एक्सपायर हो गई है अ ह्यूमन बीइंग ऑफ लाइफ विद फीलिंग्स हु हैड गिवन यू समथिंग and experience and skill, who consented to it, who agreed to it, even though he didn't have to. I don't even know if he knew that. And he's gone. And nobody cares. Or at least they pretend not to care. So 
So I don't want to prepare you to deal with that desensitization. Don't think it's not going to happen to you. The default is that it will. Our curriculum, our training is designed somehow that it does happen. That you look at them not as humans, but as disease categories, as diagnostic entities. As people who are responding or not responding to your treatment regimens. As, as samples, specimens, subjects, cases, anything but human beings. That is not okay. That is not okay. So you want to keep your experiences of loss as opportunities for keeping your kindness, your empathy, your love alive. For in the death of a loved one who was genuinely loved is life for you spiritually, socially, for what you can give. We find manifestation of that. The, the symbology in the biological world is so apparent. It is so clear. It is something that you've been studying since however long it's been since you've been studying biology. Anything biological, plant or animal, when it dies, that death is a source of life for that soil, for the plants in the environment, and then the life that emanates from those plants. So a process of grieving, a process of genuine grieving, should result in your ability to be more alive and to give more life. And that is when the legacy of the departed, the meaning in their death, has been actualized by those who truly loved them. Thank you ever so much for your time, this opportunity for me to share my thoughts. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free. My apologies to the organ if I missed the outline that you made. No, sir, no, sir. It was perfect. And we really ended up on a really important note because I'm pretty sure everybody here has really thought about this on how we can prevent ourselves from, like, in the future being so desensitized that we start treating patients like subjects and not actual human beings. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to, like, talk about that right now as well. And we have a few minutes left. And anybody, if, you, if anyone has any questions, you can also unmute and ask them or leave them in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Ruba. Thank, Thank you so you, much sir, for the session and Gee. it was very helpful, especially the fish concept. I really like that one. And the being numb part. I hope we don't go numb when we treat our patients and understand the sensitivity. Thank you so much sir, for the session. It was really helpful. Thank you, Laiba. I hope so too. Thank you for organizing everything. Thank you. So much, sir. Thank you.
Thank you, Ayman. Thank you, Hera. Thank you, Asma. Assalamualaikum, uh, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the session. Um, it was it was really like it hit home. Uh, I don't really have a question. I do have something to share, though. Uh, like the thing that you said about doctors getting desensitized. I remember. Um, uh, this is about more than a year ago. But um, my grandmother passed away, and I went to you know unka janaza wagera sab kuch. Then I came back. When I came back to college, I got sick. And uh, I went to the doctor and I I just, I don't know, I just mentioned it that, you know, yeah, my grandmother passed away last week and Isna. And um, she she said to me, she was like, Bas kya kare beta, aaj nani chali gai hai, kal ko ammi chali jayengi, kya kare? And it just, yeah, it just, um, it, like, it's, you know, maybe she just meant it as an offhand comment, but it stuck with me still. So, like, I really understand your point about how, you know, get, doctors get desensitized. That actually reminds me. Um, one of our fellow trainees was also rotating in medicine. So uh, um, one of the patients passed away and the professor of medicine, parents, so the medicine professor turns to the psychiatry training, like you're from psychiatry, go talk to this mother, make her feel better. And that's not what you're supposed to do. I mean, she's crying, let her cry. You're not supposed to make her feel better. Her son just died. And the psychiatry training was also cheating. He said, professor, you have to do it. He said, go and go and say, no problem, one son is dead, the other son is dead. How do you do that? How do we become that? Yes, so, so like, I have something to share too. Like, um, first of all, my name is Mom. I'm a grand Mom, um, your, your voice is a little um, unclear. If you can move a little further from the mic. Oh, uh, okay. So, is it better now? A little no. better. No better? It's not. Is it better now? A little better. <laughs> um, should I? Like... It's fine. Um, it's fine. Okay. Okay. So no, I just wanted to say that like um, I had a like similar experience. Like it would also be one of the reasons that I decided to organize this webinar. Um, I also like lost my mom last year. And I watched her pass away, and it was really sudden. And then, like, I remember in my neighborhood, there was this doctor, and I saw her bleed, like, my mom, I saw her bleeding, and the doctor was just like, let it be, stop trying, and like, like, stop crying, it's okay. And she was so, like, desensitized from all of it, and it was almost like disrespectful. So, I do realize the part that. Doctors becoming so desensitized that they see patients as like almost objects. I also want to talk about something, especially when we are in BH near the cadaver. So I think that people are not very serious and they don't respect the cadaver. That is also a person. And I think we should respect them more or like we shouldn't joke around that. And I have seen myself and my class fellows do that. So in challenge yeah, which I will try to be more sensitive. Exactly. Like I remember when we first um, went to the beach, we were almost like we were also sure that we we're gonna treat like the cadavers with so much respect because they were people themselves. But I saw people become desensitized by the end of that first lecture as well. So it really worries me that how are we gonna keep that humanity in us throughout our career? Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for delivering this session. It was amazing and it helped a lot. Thank you for your Thank time. You.
thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing, um, Laiba. I think that's actually where it starts. The the the, the dissection hall. That's where the Please. desensitization, the first the first blow, is right there. Yes, sir. Thank you, Aruba, for sharing your experience as well. Okay. Mm, no questions. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, my name is Maan Amir. It was a great session, sir. I have a little question. Uh, you are very right about the um, uh, desensitization and all, but uh, don't you think that uh, it'll affect the doctor's life too? Like if they come home and they're still in that phase of mind, uh, the grief and all, uh, wouldn't it be affecting his life too? But, uh, the next day when he goes to the hospital, I don't think he'll be able to cope with the uh, situation that well. Thank you. Um, thank you for asking that question. See, when we as non-doctors or as medical students not desensitized yet when we attend a funeral or when we are with a grieving person we're not as sad we are not as broken we are not as overwhelmed as they are naturally which is why we're in a position to help them through that time one of them may be in shock not knowing what to do and we are sad for them and we are we may have known the deceased as well as an uncle or an auntie or um you know as a friend's father or mother we may have shed a couple of tears ourselves Nevertheless, the degree of emotions is not that much that we're shocked into like inability to do anything. We still can do a whole lot more than they can in that situation. And so we help. And that comes from a place of caring and concern and not being desensitized. So bringing from that analogy to, um, to the medical profession, will the life of that doctor be affected as he goes home, as he goes the next day to his clinic? To a certain degree, yes. And it should be. But if it is to the effect of rendering them incapable of performing their responsibility, of their duties, then yes, that's a pathology. But an equal degree of pathology is when it is not affecting them at all to the point that they cannot express basic empathy to their patients, that they are rude, that they're unethical, there is illegitimate polypharmacy going on, there's tests that should not be done that are being done, that they are passing on the worst news, worst news that the patient has ever heard so casually, yeah, that's a bigger pathology. That's a big, so somewhere along, you know, we need to strike a balance. As a community, we need to be concerned about, as a community of physicians, a community of healers, we need to be concerned with developing that balance. Because if we're not, then there is something seriously wrong. And that's, I mean, we are, we're sick. We're sick. 
the entire community of sick doctors, mentally sick. Yes, sir. Okay, I understand now. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum, sir. Ji, walaikum assalam. Uh, sir, my name is Nermeen Fatima. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the amazing session. I mean, like every part of it was so relevant and so relatable. And I'd just like to share an example of it. Just say, you said that whenever there is a loss of a loved one, first the emotion part dominates, then the responsibility part dominates. And uh, uh, like about that, I could think uh, of an example of my grandparents. I uh, they passed away long, long before. Or मतलब obviously मतलब मैं तो बहुत छोटी थी जब उनकी death हुई थी या मेरे दादा की तो मेरी before my birth he passed away तो I'm sure कि मतलब मेरे parents के ऊपर जो भी वो उस वक्त पहले वाला part emotional part वाला था लेकिन अब जाके obviously वो emotional part उतना नहीं रहा and there's more of the responsibility part and then comes the concept of इसाले सवाब और वो जो उनके नाम पे कुर्बानी होती है every time and everything so yeah that's like very true and I have a question that you talked about achieving a balance right so, मतलब, how do we achieve a balance between uh, the empathy that we have to show as medical professionals and, and like because it is going to be an everyday part of our life. So, मतलब, how do we achieve that balance? Thank you. Um, thank you, Nermeen, for sharing that example foremost and then for the question. It is, of course, there's stuff that has to do with medical education there is stuff that has to do with the the whole training process and then there is stuff that has to do with the role models that you have and there's a lot of stuff that's wrong there um and all i can do in those areas is to implore you all of you some of you are going to be in um in medical education, a lot of you are going to be specialists. You're going to be professors in your own right. Um, just carry this concern that things need to change. Curriculum, administrative processes, and the inspirational role model that you are. For at least that's and there's 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 practical steps as well. There's technical steps as well. There's theoretical steps as well. Um, theoretical conceptions that need to translate into practical steps that a whole lot of that I can recommend but of course that's beyond your scope right now as medical students but as medical students what can you do as at a, at a personal capacity or an individual capacity I do feel um, that taking some time every day or if not every day then every week individually as well as in groups to reflect to as a meditative process remind yourself ki aaj main clinic mein baithi hu aaj maine bahut se mareezon ko dekhna hai bahut se strangers se milna hai जिनको जब तकलीफ होती है दर्द होती है बीमारी होती है उसी तरह होती है जिस तरह मुझे होती है मैंने जब मैं कंफ्यूज होती थी जब मैं बीमार होकर अस्पताल जाती थी मेरा क्या हाल होता था जब मेरे किसी चाहने वाले के साथ ऐसा होता था उस वक्त मैं क्या किस कैफियत से गुजरती थी टेक यूर सेल्फ बैक इन टाइम as a human being this is a gift we can time travel in our head with our language skills relive those moments re-experience that pain don't forget it don't deny it jo inhumane expression aapko nazar aata hai opds mein aur wards mein that's because these are people who have denied their own pain to themselves i don't want to think about it i don't want to talk about it मुझे तो कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ा एटसेट्रा वट एवर री लिव दैट पेन आइडियली एवरी डे बट एट लीस्ट एवरी वीक वन एवर समथिंग लाइक दैट रिमेंबर जो अटेंडेंट्स आ रहे हैं 
कौन कितनी गाड़ियां बदल के आ रहा है कितना पैसे खर्च करके आ रहा है अपनी सारी सेविंग्स लगा के आ रहा है मेक योर सेल्फ फोर्स योर माइंड टू गो देर फोर्स योर माइंड टू गो देर एक दूसरे से बात करने में एक दूसरे को याद कराने में एंड वेन यू गो वेन यू डू सी सम वन tell them some break bad news to them or to their family members take a moment to express your empathy by acknowledging their feelings think about it express it and when somebody passes away in your ward on your watch grieve with them the way you would grieve the death of a friend's loved one unke sath baithna unko wo respect dena unko wo time dena you're a doctor on call in the ward you don't have a lot to do a lot of times but even when you do you can always take a minute take a few seconds offer a prayer culturally appropriate religiously appropriate make that a practice and you will be laughed at your colleagues are going to be like tera dimag kharab hai what are you doing what are you thinking you'll have all of that chale i have to run i have another appointment um, which started a minute ago so thank you all you are a wonderful audience for your appreciation please feel free to reach out to me or my team on our facebook pages if you have any further questions in any way and we'll do what we can to help all right thank you sir for the session uh, we don't talk to you anymore <laughs> all right thank you for being here laugh is kana kalam ho bhi hum dekh kitna shuru wala sab sab na chhu bolte laugh is sir